paper on the program and, and many thanks to Neil for agreeing to discuss my paper. So this is my job market paper titled Engineering Lemons. And let me start today with uh, motivation from the literature on financial innovation. Okay, so, so broadly, there are two views of financial innovation. The predominant view in academic literature is the beneficial view. Okay, so in, in those papers, financial innovation, new financial products or new services are usually designed to meet some unmet demand of adopters. You can think of that, for example, by spending new payoffs, lowering transaction costs, or allowing investors to avoid regulation or to lower their taxes. Now, opposed to this beneficial view, there is an alternative, less optimistic view, which I call here exploitative view, or you can also think of that as rent-seeking view. Petra, sorry, uh, I don't see your, your slides. Uh, am I the only one? No, I think, okay, that's good, sorry. Okay, sorry so I can go ahead. Um, so, so compared to the beneficial view, there is also less optimistic view, what I call here exploitative view, or you can also think of that as rent-seeking view. Uh, and in this view, financial intermediaries would be designing products not necessarily to benefit adopters, but often to exploit them, okay? So for example, they may design products that allow them to charge higher fees or that exploit unsophisticated investors by pushing them to take on more risk. And even though this kind of opinion is relatively common, both among academics and policymakers and in society, when it comes to the empirical literature, we have relatively few papers on this exploitative view, okay? So one promising direction is the literature on retail structured products. So we know from early work of, of Neil that sometimes retail structured products tend to be very expensive. We also know from work of Boris and Claire that complexity plays an important role both in the design and in performance of retail structured products. But even with this evidence, you could still say that you do not observe investor preferences or their beliefs, and it is possible that even expensive and complex structured products are designed to benefit some investors with particular beliefs or particular preferences, okay? So this, this gap is gonna be the gap I will try to fill in my paper. Uh, and to do that, I will provide a first large sample evidence on cost and benefits of a class of retail structured products. So these are gonna be yield enhancement products, and I will show you on the next slide an example so that you understand what kind of products I'm talking about. And to give you my results in a nutshell, I first quantify what are the fees of those securities, and I find that they are very expensive, six to seven percent per annum in fees. They also exposed lose six to seven percent relative to risk adjusted benchmarks. Now, what is important is the fact that these fees are so high that both the expected and the ex post returns are on average negative. Okay? So this means that unless you have an investor who is investing in yield enhancement products either for hedging or speculative motives, uh, these products do not benefit investors because you would be on average better off just by keeping your money in the mattresses. Now the final result is that a large fraction of the products, 30 to 45 percent, are first order stochastically dominated by simple listed options. Okay, so for those products, uh, dominated yield enhancement products do not benefit investors even for hedging or speculative motives because you can achieve those um, in a cheaper way with listed options. Okay. So to show you an example, uh, let me show you a payoff diagram of one yield enhancement product and then also a diagram of a payoff I can construct with simple listed options. So here is a payoff diagram in the gray color. I'm depicting three-month reverse convertible, which is linked to JP Morgan Chase. Okay, so as long as the stock of JP Morgan Chase does not fall by more than 25% on any day during the life of the product or any day during these three months, then investors at maturity will receive back their principal. And on top of that, 11.5% monthly coupon. 11.5% is the annual coupon rate. If JP Morgan Chase drops by 25% or more, then investors will be participating in the downside uh, fall at maturity. So what I do is I take two put options of JP Morgan Chase and I construct this simple payoff, which approximates the payoff at maturity of the original yield enhancement product, but it also dominates the original product. And I can 
use the prices of the put options which are used for the construction to calculate what is the implied coupon rate of the synthetic cap. So I find that this is, for this particle product, you could achieve more than 25% annual coupon rate just by shorting one put option and, and um, are going along another put option. And so this means that I can construct a payoff that dominates the app across all dimensions in all states of the world and for any investor that has access to listed options. Okay. So with this result, I contribute first to the literature on financial innovation. Um, so I provide new evidence that new financial products are not always intended to benefit adopters. And in fact, my results are more consistent with the rent seeking view of financial innovation. I also contribute to the literature on uh, complexity in finance. So I provide a new clean way how to isolate the effect of complexity and, and quantify that in this case, complexity does not benefit investors. And finally, I also contribute to the literature on structured products. Uh, so I provide the first large sample evidence on the performance. I will also show you some new evidence on the manipulation of common performance measures of structured products uh, through some specific features of the securities. And I will show you a new method that is not prone to this manipulation and that you can use to benchmark the performance of the securities. So I will spend most of the talk around the results, but before that, let me just quickly describe what is the data I have and what is the valuation model I use. So all the securities I have in my sample are uh, registered with the SEC. So you could go on Edgar and look at all, look at all the terms of the securities in the prospectuses. Uh, now, the prospectuses are not always well structured, so it's not trivial to extract all the terms of the securities. So instead of that, I will be using novel data from a commercial platform that collects uh, all the information on product payoffs from the prospectuses and records this information in a semi-structured textual payoff description. Okay. I also validate that the coverage of the platform is comprehensive, and I also validate that the descriptions in the platform are in most cases correct. Where they are not correct, I'm able to, to correct them because I can use the information from the prospectuses. And I will then develop a simple textual algorithm that translates the textual payoff description into mathematical payoff formulas, which I can then evaluate uh, and price. To give you an example, here is uh, a description of the product I showed you a few slides back. So it specifies what is the underlying, it specifies what is the annual coupon rate, and then it describes what are the conditions for the payoff at maturity. So I take this and uh, extract all the terms to, to calculate, uh, to, to create a mathematical payoff formula. So my sample is uh, gonna cover almost a decade. It runs from January 2006 to October 2015. I'm only gonna look at yield enhancement products linked to equities so that I can use data on evaluation inputs from option metrics. Um, now, I'm not gonna be able to translate all the product payoffs because there is a lot of heterogeneity in the terms, but I will have more than 90% coverage with a sample that has more than 28,000 securities and covers more than 55 billion of uh, annual issuance, uh, 55 billion of total issuance volume. The most common payoffs will be reverse convertibles or auto callables. Uh, and I will be valid validating my translated formulas uh, with returns from the platform, also returns from independent consulting firm, and also with secondary prices in trace. So just a few comments about the summary statistics. Um, the average coupon rate, or sometimes also called headline rate, in my sample is almost 13%. So this is way above the prevailing risk free rate during my sample period. Um, on average, investors are protected against any downside losses uh, up to 27, 26% losses uh, in the underlying. Um, the term of the securities is relatively short. So even if you exclude the possibility of early terminations, the average maturity is only 0.8 to one year. And often the maturity is even shorter because the products can be called before maturity. Uh, the press charge relatively high commissions, so 1.8% on average per product, and they also have a very risky underlyings. So the average beta at issuance is 1.6, so this would be a common number for the top one or two deciles in, in US stocks. This increases the probability that you will lose uh, some of your principal at maturity. So uh, the fees of the products are all embedded, and to quantify them, 
what the literature usually does is that it quantifies the fair value of the security at issuance and then whatever is the difference between the price and the fair value is the embedded margin or you can also calculate it in terms of fees so to do that you need a valuation model i will be using local volatility diffusion which follows some of the um, methods used in the literature and also what is commonly used in the industry I will allow for jumps on ex dividend days because most of my securities are gonna be linked to single name stocks. And then using this local volatility model, I will be pricing vanilla and barrier options with finance difference scheme, digital options I will price with static replication, and finally for highly power dependent auto callables, I will have to do Monte Carlo simulations. All the valuations inputs I use are fairly standard. So let me just mention that the volatility comes from option metrics volatility surface. And then to interpolate between the discrete volatilities I observe in option metrics, I will use non-parametric arbitrage-free interpolation following Andresen and Huge. I do this because this is the common uh, way to, to do that in the pricing software that uh, the issuing banks often use. I also have access to this software so I can validate my estimates with estimates from, from the software and I find that they are highly correlated and, and that there is no bias. Okay, so let me now focus on what I find, what are the results? First, uh, when it comes to the fees or the, the margins that the products charge, uh, I define the margin as the difference between the issue price normalized to one and the fair value. And this is on average three and a half percent in the sample of more than 28,000 securities. Now, in terms of annual fees, by dividing the estimated margin with the expected maturity, I find that the annual fees are on average more than 7% and uh, more than 5.7% in terms of volume, volume weighted average, okay? So to put this number in a perspective, we know that retail financial products tend to be expensive, but uh, six to 7% is fairly high fee even in the retail financial context, okay? So comparing fees of yield enhancement products, for example, to um, the categories of mutual funds, you find that yield enhancement products are pretty much an outlier. I can then take those fair values and quantify what would be the expected return of the security by replacing the risk-free rate in the diffusion with an objective expected return on the underlying. Okay? I do many versions, to give you just a simple sort of MBA calculation. I take the product beta, the underlying beta at issuance and multiply it by a 6% equity premium uh, and with this assumption, I quantify that the total expected return in my sample is negative 18 basis points uh, on volume weighted basis. In terms of annual expected returns, this translates to a negative 1%. Okay? So this is not driven only by some outliers, even the median returns are negative. And I can also quantify that this is not only um, um, limited to the ex ante evidence, but I can also look at the ex post evidence and find that even ex post, the products have on average negative returns. So to do that, to look at what is the ex post performance, this is not entirely trivial either because uh, most of these securities are not listed. So we do not have data on their ex post returns or secondary prices. So what I will be doing, I will substitute the spot prices into the translated payoff formulas and I will calculate what is the payoff of the product, what is the return of the product at maturity. And then to risk adjust those returns, I will do it uh, with two approaches. First, I can calculate abnormal returns over delta hedged returns. So I will calculate daily delta of the securities and then construct a portfolio of the underlying and the risk free rate. I can also construct an index of FIEP performance on, on daily basis by using the fair prices of the underlying products on every day during the lifetime of the product. And I can then regress this yet performance index on CBOE put index uh, and other factors to quantify what is the alpha. Okay? Uh, the results from both of those methods are gonna be fairly consistent. So to first just show you what is the average performance uh, in terms of total returns, the products was on average almost 4%. In terms of abnormal returns, that would be minus 3.25%. Similar numbers when annualizing the returns. So the products uh, on average lost 3.5% in terms of annual returns and in terms of abnormal returns, almost 6%. Okay, so these abnormal returns are fairly similar to the ex ante margins and fees I, I, I quantified. 
one important thing is that this poor exposed performance is not driven solely by the financial crisis. So let me next show you a time series evidence on the performance of the product. So what I do here, I'm plotting the log growth of two uh, indices, which I construct from fair prices of yield enhancement products um, over their life. So the, the bottom line is the index that adjusts for fees. So it includes the, the overpricing on the first insurance day. The second line plots the YEP index, excluding fees. So this would be the gross performance if investors were not charged any margin by the issuers. And finally, the third line plots the CBOE put index. So the reason to pick CBOE put index is that it uh, also shorts put options similarly to YEP. So it is sort of reasonably taking into account the fact that yield enhancement products do not have linear payoffs and they are exposing investors to large losses uh, because they are shorting put options. I can then take those uh, YEP indices and regress them on the CBOE put index and other factors. And I find that the annualized alpha of the, the net index adjusted for fees is almost 8%. The underperformance mostly comes from the fees. There's also some underperformance that comes from the selection of the underlines that could be for many reasons. Um, for example, there could be, um, um, the, the underlines could be selected based on some sentiment and, and these uh, stocks then tend to underperform. They also have social evidence that the underlines tend to have really high volatility and we know that highly volatile um, underlyings with expensive put options tend to underperform as well. Nevertheless, most of the underperformance comes from the fees, not from the selection of the underlyings. So one important thing and one useful aspect of those indices is that it allows to uh, adjust for some of the biases that you get if you just used average annualized returns of the products. So in particular, in the paper, I show that when it comes to auto-callable products, which include early termination features, if you just calculate average annualized returns, it's going to look like that autocollables outperform the other products in my sample. So they would have average annualized returns of almost 7%, whereas the other securities pretty much return zero returns. This is all because uh, autocollables uh, can be called early, as early as after three months often. And in, in the case they are called, they typically have a positive performance which means that if you then annualize this return and take average, you're gonna be overweighting the short uh, term products and therefore you will get a biased performance measure. Okay? If instead of average annualized returns, you use an, the YEP index, which I constructed on the previous slide, you will see that uh, auto collables do not outperform the other securities uh, in my sample. Uh, in fact, they perform slightly worse than the other securities. So in the last six minutes, let me show you the evidence on dominated yield enhancement products. Um, to do that, for each yield enhancement product that can be approximated with up to two put options, I construct a synthetic yet. And so this is gonna be a security that the most closely approximates the payoff of the original yield enhancement product at maturity. So for example, for the product that I showed you uh, early in my presentation, I take one uh, short position and one put option with one uh, strike price. I take another position, long position in a put option. And with this combination, by lending the principal amount of the security at the risk-free rate, I can create a payoff that closely approximates the YAPs, the original YAP, and I can quantify what is the coupon rate from the security. Whenever the coupon rate, is higher than the coupon rate of the original product, then I can say that the synthetic counterpart is dominating the yield enhancement product. So in a sample of 17,000 securities, I find that the synthetic YAPs have very similar implied coupon rates to the original product. Okay, so in this sample, the coupon rate of YAPs is on average 13%, and the coupon rate, implied coupon rate of the synthetic counterparts is more than 11.5%. This is despite the fact that the synthetic counterparts often offer way better downside protection than the original yield enhancement products for many reasons, because they do not include the exotic um, payoffs, because I cannot 
as closely approximate the, the moneyness of the original yield enhancement product. So I always have to take the next available put option, which is going to have better protection than the original security, etc. Okay. So even though the synthetic counterparts offer way better protection, they don't offer that much lower coupon rate. In fact, for a large fraction of the products, this coupon rate is higher than the coupon rate of the original security. So here I'm just plotting the distribution of the difference between the coupon rate of the original yield enhancement product and the synthetic security. And I find that for 30 to 44%, depending on the specification, the coupon rate from the synthetic counterpart is higher. What is important is that I cannot explain this dominance with transaction costs. So the prices I, I used are adjusted for bid ask spreads. I cannot explain it with commissions. Uh, I cannot explain it with the difference between European and American style exercise. So the structured products that European exercise, single name options will have American style exercise. That doesn't explain the dominance. Uh, I cannot explain it the difference in uh, maturities, with leverage, or with minimum investment amounts. So this makes me, uh, th this takes me to the last uh, section of my presentation. What then makes investor buying yield enhancement products that they could get way better payoffs with uh, simple listed options? Um, well, first of all, yield enhancement products are often sold to uh, unsophisticated investors. It's predominantly sold to retail investors. There's some, inv uh, some evidence from regulatory investigation that there is a lot of mis-selling and that there is targeting of investors who are not likely to understand the features of the securities. I also find evidence consistent with catering to investor biases. Uh, so there is some evidence consistent with salience. High coupon rates are salient to advertise. The losses, you need to use option pricing techniques to, to quantify them. In addition, oftentimes, these losses are framed not as a loss, but instead as delivery of the physical delivery of the underlying asset, uh, which is consistent uh, with some kind of mental accounting. Um, um, catering by the issuers. I also find that the issuers pick um, highly volatile underlyings, uh, which are uh, more likely to underperform, which are more likely to um, fall below the threshold and therefore drive the, the negative losses. So if investors are not properly uh, accounting for the high volatility of the underlyings, they will perceive the products to be more valuable than what they are. And I also can also quantify what are the commissions from selling yield enhancement products versus commissions from selling the cheaper listed options. And I find that for brokers, it is uh, significantly more beneficial to recommend yield enhancement products compared to the simple listed options. So with that, and with one last minute, uh, I will conclude. So in this paper, I provide the first large sample evidence on cost and benefits of yield enhancement securities. I find that they are fairly expensive, six to 7% in annual fees they expose underperform uh, risk adjusted benchmarks by six to seven percent. They have both ex ante and exposed negative returns, and many times they are dominated by simple listed options. So, with that, I contribute uh, to the literature on financial innovation and offering new evidence on the rent seeking view of financial innovation. I'm very much looking forward to the comments by Neil. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Petra. Uh, perfect timing, even with my unwarranted interruption. My apologies. Uh, on this note, Neil, uh, the floor is all yours. All right. Thanks very much. Um, it's, I, I was about to say it's a pleasure to attend your conference, but it's, it's a pleasure to attend your conference when it's in Montreal. It's, it's, it's still a pleasure, but less of a pleasure to attend it online. But anyway, um, why? So, you know, so my overall, it's a pleasure to discuss this paper though. So, my overall reaction is that it's a great paper. So this was Petra's job market paper and I actually saw, saw it in a poster presentation at the Helsinki Finance Summit in August, 2017. And you know, and I thought then it was a very interesting paper. Um, and, but there were still, you know, a couple of loose ends or a couple of gaps that needed to be closed. And, you know, I think in the last year, year and a half, Petra has closed the gaps. And I think it's a great paper. I mean, one of the reasons why her poster caught my eye about a year and a half ago was that I had for a long time thought about writing a similar paper. 
but I had shied away from the tremendous amount of work that would be involved to value all of the products. And I'm, I'm glad to see that Petra has done all the work. Uh, so anyway, so mostly I'm going to talk on it. My remarks will focus on putting the paper in context and its contribution and make a few more comments about, make a few additional comments. Okay, so I see it that there's really two main results, right? So Brian Hannertis and I wrote an earlier paper where we looked at one class of structured, one brand of structured products issued by Morgan Stanley. And, you know, we picked that particular brand because it was the most popular brand of structured products during our sample period, but a limitation of our paper was that it's only one brand. And so one of the main results of this paper is that this result that the expected return is less than zero holds in the universe of SEPs. Uh, it's not just a characteristic of the one brand studied by me and Brian. It's not just a characteristic of the relatively small sample of European uh, structured products studied by Boris. Okay, and you know, the one thing I like about this paper is I think, for reasons I'll talk about later, the paper sort of establishes this result beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, the second contribution, second what I think is the second big contribution, uh, is that a large fraction of the EPS are dominated by simple options portfolios, right? And the real, con the, I see the importance of this contribution um, you know, so, so you have a result or Brian and I had this result that the expected returns are negative and people would say, well, what if, you know how finance professors are, they would say, well, what if it's hedging? What if it's this? What if it's that? And I think the, the strength of this result is that it really kills any rational story. If you have any rational reason why you should buy yeps, you should buy the options portfolio that dominates them. Okay, and the paper also includes some other nice results. Okay, so why do I think the results are interesting, right? So I think, you know, it changes the way or potentially changes the way you should think about derivatives. So, you know, your favorite derivatives dealer, whoever it is, can construct almost any state contingent payoff. And the reason I say almost any rather than any is, you know, there are some payoffs that they can't reasonably hedge. But subject to that, co that caveat, they can construct almost any state contingent payoff. Okay, and this is potentially extremely beneficial. Right, it can complete markets, allow investors to hedge risks, optimize the risk return trade off, help investors implement their optimal consumption portfolio plan. Right, this is why Bob Merton thought derivatives were so wonderful. Right, but if Goldman Sachs can construct any state contingent payoff, it, then Goldman Sachs can exploit any mistake you make. Right. If you have some cognitive bias that causes you to over or undervalue certain events, certain states of the world, then Goldman Sachs can construct a, a security that you will overvalue. Right. And so so anyway, um, so anyway, the paper provides what I think is just extremely convincing evidence consistent with what Petra called the exploitative view of financial innovation and financial derivatives. Okay, so how does she obtain the main results? Uh, uses a standard derivatives valuation models calibrated to standard data set. Uh, then using reasonable assumptions about market risk premium and estimating betas, you know, market risk premium and risk premium on individual stocks estimates the expected cash flows under the physical measure. Um, just in the exposition, it's not exactly clear how she does this, whether she does it by Monte Carlo or solving the appropriate PDE because the expected, you know, using finite difference techniques. Um, but that's a little detail. We'll just assume she does it correctly. 
Uh, but anyway, so, but under reasonable assumptions about risk premium, expected cash flows are less than the offering prices, right? So then they have negative expected returns, okay? And so I'll just have an easy way to understand what the results actually mean using the Morgan Stanley Sparks as an example, okay? Uh, some of these appear in Petra's sample. They're roughly covered calls. They're not exactly covered, simple covered calls because the call price changes over time, but the sparks are roughly covered calls where the investor receives the call premium in the form of the high coupon. They had a maturity of about one year and a markup of about 8%. So with a one year maturity and 8% markup, the alpha was negative 8% per year relative to the replicating portfolio of stock and bonds. The sparks were less risky than the underlying stock. You'd expect the risk premium to be about 60% of the risk premium on the underlying stock. So really what's going on, the results, low, relatively low risk product that is less risky than the underlying stock, alpha of negative 8% per year, you get negative expected returns, All right? So this is kind of the main, this is what's, this is why, what's going on in the results and why the expected returns are negative. Okay, uh, so why do I say that the paper establishes these results beyond any doubt? The result that the expected return is less than the risk-free rate or actually negative just follows from the estimates of the overpricing. Why should you believe the estimates of the overpricing? She uses static replication for the YEPs for which this is appropriate. No, can't, no doubt about that those values are correct, or at least that they're correct given the option metrics volatility surface. For the others, she uses a local volatility model. Okay, well, well why is it reasonable to use a local volatility model? Well, they're used by practitioners, but there's also this literature on quasi-static replication that tells you that under some assumptions, Barrier options can be approximated by portfolios of, or equivalent to, or can be approximated by portfolios of vanillas. By construction, local volatility models reprice the vanillas. If local volatility models replace the vanillas and barrier options are portfolios of vanillas or approximated by portfolios of vanillas, then it follows that local volatility model should correctly price the barrier options. And in this case, that means correctly price the YEPs. Okay, and then the other thing is, she does a careful analysis of the ex post returns. And even though she doesn't emphasize this in the paper, this validates the pricing date results in a particular way. Just for a minute, let's take the issuer's perspective, Morgan Stanley's perspective. In these data, the losses to the investors are revenue to the issuers. If the valuation model was incorrect, then from the perspective of Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, one would expect to see a P&L leak and the profit from the YEPs would not be realized. Right, so the fact that the ex post returns are consistent with Petra's initial estimates of overpricing really provides a lot of confidence that the valuation model is correct. Okay, um, she has some other results. The bias performance measure is not one of the main results in the paper, but it's a nice result, nice analysis. And then the index of the YEPS performance, it's not really independent of the other results. It follows directly from the overpricing. Um, but I think it's a really nice way to communicate the results to a non-specialist audience, right? It's a really nice way. The, the, it, the negative performance and the index she constructs is not really independent of the other results. It's not really a different result, but it's a nice way to package. I see it as a nice way to package the results for other audiences. 
uh, you know, and then toward the end, toward the end of the paper, she studies, she, she discusses some of the hypotheses to explain demand for SEPs. You know, this is not the focus of the paper. The things she says are perfectly reasonable. Um, it's just in this section, I think it would just make sense to reemphasize the fact um, that the results that YEPs are dominated by simple options portfolio kills any rational explanation for why investors like SEPs, right? Because that's in some sense, that's a really, you know, that's a very strong result that you really kill, seems like it kills almost any rational explanation. Okay, so, you know, one of the reasons I'm so positive on this paper is I have no doubt that the results are correct. And then, you know, for years, I've been on this mission to try to communicate to everyone that they should never buy these products. They're unambiguously bad for investors. And I like the paper because it, it makes, it documents that in the universe of products. Um, and, it, you know, and I think after this paper, this, this result that these products have negative expected returns has been documented beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, anyway, so I'm, um, you know, I, people might not have expected to me this, I think this in my entire career, this is the most positive discussion I have ever given. Uh, but I just think it's a great paper. And I hope it ends up having a pol some policy impact because I think these products are just evil. This is a very strong uh, discussion, a uh, very <laughs> strong claim. Uh, Petra, anything to answer to this very positive discussion? <laughs> So, so thanks a lot, Neil, for, for those comments, and hopefully I can get your slides. Um, so I noticed uh, I noticed one minor point that I'm not the first one to look at ex post performance, so I should probably qualify that. that I, I believe I'm the first one to look at the risk-adjusted performance, ex post performance in a large sample. I haven't seen anyone before me doing that, but yes, there is some evidence in uh, using not risk-adjusted returns or looking at small samples. Um, yeah, um, I, I will try to do my best with the policy impact, but it doesn't entirely depend on me. But thanks a lot for the discussion, yeah. Great. Uh, at this point, I will turn to the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know in the chat and I can ask you to unmute. Uh, otherwise, I kind of feel like putting Boris on the spot. Uh, he started, uh, he made a comment at some point where uh, he talks about some of his results in uh, the Swedish Capital Guaranteed Products. Uh, Boris, do you mind, uh, you know, going over your, your, your point again for us? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm fully sympathetic to the message that uh, security design is a great way to extract rent. I mean, I have some research on that. Um, but I think it's also important to have a nuanced approach in general. Uh, and there, are, there might be instances where security design uh, might not be as exploitative uh, as, as in, in some other context. And so this is why I was mentioning, I mean, we, we have a project where we study capital guaranteed product. Uh, and, and there, we, we do find expected returns that are above the risk-free rate on average. And so the idea is that this product might actually foster people uh, to participate to, uh, to the risk premium. Uh, and so I guess I'm just in general interested in thinking about when can, when can it be exploitative, when can it be having a positive impact, I think so that uh, the regulator, we are talking about policy, does not necessarily take a a one size fits all approach uh, to, to security design. Yeah, thank you, Boris. Uh, you want to answer to this, uh, Petra? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm, um, I'm very sympathetic to that. So, so uh, obviously looking at the universe in, in different countries and different types of products, I do agree that my sample in this paper is one of the worst ones. Uh, and definitely the, the products sold in Nordics back in the days, back in 2000s were way better. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the view that some of them can have positive expected returns. Um, yeah, and hopefully we will get more papers in the future uh, 
you know, figuring out when is it that you get these uh, exploitative products and when is it that you get better products. Can I, can I jump in with something which I, I wish I, I neglected to emphasize in my discussion, right? So that it's, in, it is important to emphasize that Petra's paper applies to the universe of U.S. yield enhancement products. There are products that are not yield enhancement products and they may be beneficial to investors. Good point. Uh, maybe s slightly tangential to this, since no one is asking a question, I will, uh, I will allow myself to ask one. Um, <clears throat> you don't talk much about the distribution of the payoffs, right? Uh, and, you know, I, 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 strong, I, I, I do believe your results and I'm, you know, I've maybe I've been listening to Neil a lot in the last few years, but I kind of agree with him. Uh, but, uh, but, but still, I mean, one of the arguments you can make about, especially about the risk adjusted results is you're looking kind of at kind of a, a second order risk, but maybe these, one argument you could make is that these products are designed to create positive skewness, for instance, and that even though they are kind of, they have negative return or, you know, that, this, they are dominated in some way. Maybe uh, if you create some positive skewness that is not in the underlying, maybe some investors with you know a utility function that weighs on skewness uh, would you know rationally choose these products. Do you have do you have something to say about this or? No, so, so like a typical question is that could this be designed for lottery type preferences? So so the the design of yield enhancement products is the exact opposite from what you from what lottery uh, type preferences would want is so you get a fixed upside uh, and possibly large downside, uh, which is very different. And, and still, you know, even, I'm very sympathetic to the view that investors may have different preferences. They would still be better off just by buying listed options. Okay, yeah. so that so that's one of the points that like independent of the preferences, salience preferences, all kinds of weird preferences, uh, you should just go with listed options. Good. So anyone in the audience, we still have a few minutes before. Yeah, I can, can I speak? Yeah, welcome Aurelio. Hi guys. So, welcome because I... You still there? Oh, I think we lost Aurelio. I'm here. Okay, good. I'm connected in two places, so that I'm getting my own sound. So the question is about the fact that you price your options using the implied volatile surface and not the option prices themselves. So the question is whether there's a gap between the surface and the prices. Yeah, so uh, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, what I show in the paper is that for most of the products, uh, option prices span maturities and they also span the moneyness up to the barrier of the products. But I do agree there could be difference between using option prices and the surface. So the, the, the reason to use the surface is because it's smoother. So it's just like easier uh, to, to make the local volatility surface work. Um, I can say that any results on the dominance of yield enhancement products are derived using option prices directly and using bid ask uh, spreads. So that result is independent of you know whatever option metrics does to create the surface from from the option prices. Um, I hope that answers your question. And then Aurelio, the other thing you would expect is that if there was a serious error in the valuation model then the ex post returns would not match the ex ante valuation. So that's, that's why the ex post returns is a nice result because it addresses the possibility of any serious error in the valuation model. It's one of the reasons why I say you can be highly confident that the results are correct. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, so again, in the spirit of uh, playing the devil's advocate here, uh, Kenneth Dutch uh, asked a question uh, during the, the presentation. Uh, I don't know if Kenneth wants to step in or if I just read the question, but he was essentially uh, talking about uh, structured product being used uh, as a way to avoid recognizing gains. 
uh, this is kind of, you know, this is not hedging, this is not speculative, this is kind of more accounting stuff. Uh, do, do you talk about this? I. So if I, uh, so just reading what can it draw? So essentially the idea is, you know, if you, can, can you use uh, can you use the YEPs as a way to kind of fix some accounting issues or kind of, uh, and I'm just trying to, so you know, what? this is a very strong result. The expected returns being strongly negative, the first order stochastic dominance, you know, the resistance will come from all sides as, as, as Neil said. Uh, so do, do, you, do you think that there could be accounting reasons or other kind of reasons outside of what you discuss in the paper? I talk about tax motives which is probably the closest you know, to any accounting concerns. Uh, and you cannot explain YEPs with uh, any tax motives because the, their taxation is not beneficial compared to listed options. Um, I'm not sure are there any other accounting concerns, but okay. it's definitely not taxation. Kenneth, you're jumping in. Okay, I kind of saw you coming up top on top, Kenneth, but I can't hear you. Okay, so I guess uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you so much, Petra. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, 